Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 22. This is Chelsea Alders. This week, we get to chat with Kelly Noonan Gores, the creator and director of the documentary Heal. If you haven't seen this documentary yet, it's time. Understanding the effect our emotions, thoughts, and beliefs have on our health has been a long obsession of Jay and I's, and this documentary really hit home for us. In this interview, we get to ask all the questions about how Kelly got to this space and what her inspiration was for this documentary. And we also get to hear Kelly's take on why some are so inspired to heal and some people are just so resistant. This interview is an overview on the scientific and spiritual methods Kelly discusses in the documentary. Everything from gut health, EFT, sound healing, hypnosis, the secret, mind-body connection, and meditation. We did our best to cover it all for you guys, and I hope you find something relatable for you. Our goal with this interview was to provide a teaser into all forms of natural healing. Check out the links and resources for any of the many people or methods Kelly discusses. And trust me when I tell you, it's time to watch Heal. It's on Netflix now, so no excuses. Hey, everyone. This is Jay Alders. And just a couple super quick things before we get into the conversation with Kelly. In real life, I am an artist and I would love to share my art with you. If you're looking for a print for your house or for a gift or you just want to see what I do, you can go to jayalders.com. You could find me on any social media platform. If you just look up at Jay Alders, you will find me. Chelsea, my beautiful wife, is a birth doula and she can be found at Om Mama's Doulas on Instagram or ommamasdoulas.com or her personal Instagram is at Chelsea Alders. We very much welcome all your comments and questions, and you can find us on any social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast or ShiftingPerceptionsPodcast.com. You can leave us a comment on there, and we will reply to you. Also, if you have not yet done so, we kindly request and invite you to click subscribe on your podcast player. Thank you, guys. Let's jump in. Oh. Hey, Kelly. Hi. How Hi. are you? <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. We're excited to chat with you. This is like really super cool. These the topics of your um your documentary like so impact us. These are things like right in our wheelhouse. Yeah, we're like super <laughs> yeah. big into yoga and like I meditate every day and we're very spiritual. So we're like your, your ideal audience. So we were super pumped to uh to see what you're doing. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. I love meeting like minded people out there. Right on. Yeah. Well, let's, why don't we start with just talking a little bit about your story and what led you to this documentary and, you know, some of the the stories that you were kind of, I know a lot of it comes down to the friends and family around you. And why don't we start there? Yeah. You've been like, in just the past couple of years, you're suddenly, you're an expecting mom, you're newlywed, you have a hit documentary, you're (laughs) a a public icon. Like, what what a freaking ride you've had the past few years, huh? (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, it's been it's definitely been eventful. Yeah. Um. You know, and I've it's it's yeah. Heal was my first baby, and now I'm kind of <laughs> taking my second baby. <laughs> so essentially, you, a lot of people ask me um, if I went through my own kind of healing journey, or I lost someone to cancer. I mean, it would be that would be a pretty likely motivation to make a film like this. Um, and while I have had health stuff and, and I've always kind of explored alternative health and stuff, I've never, I didn't want to put my personal stories in there because I just feel like so many others are, are worth telling, you know, mine are yeah. just, I, I feel minor and not as kind of tragic or traumatic as, as so many other people are going through right now. So, um, so that was, that was kind of, uh, it, it was more like a lifetime worth of, you know, little experiences that led me on this path of exploring spirituality and the power of the mind and learning tools like meditation and doing yoga and, and, and how all of these things, you know, drastically improved my life. And, um, you know, and then I, I started, I started reading, um, it was started about 10 years ago, I guess, or maybe, maybe 11 now that it's 2019. Um, but I'm just like a seeker and I love knowledge. So I was, I was, I started going to Agape in, um, Culver City uh, with Michael Beckwith. Um, I think, you know, I found him through watching The Secret. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so when I went there and I heard his kind of sermons or talks, I was like, oh my gosh, finally someone's articulating 
spirituality in a way that like resonates, but I never knew before how to articulate it. You know, I was raised Catholic and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, was the secret like your first introduction to this world sort of like, I think it was, I think it was definitely, um, my first introduction to kind of, you know, for like the law of attraction or how our thoughts, our energy and, you know, sending out vibrations into the world and attracting certain experiences or, you know, just really about the mind and perception and how that really shapes your life. So I think that was kind of what cracked me open. Um, But I remember like two of the big, the big parts of the secret that resonated with me was the woman who healed herself uh, from cancer by watching funny movies. Yes. I still like, I can visualize that time, like first hearing that part of that, that audio book. It's crazy. Yeah. And I thought that was just so cool. And then also Norman Cousins, you know, his story of, of, of healing yes. um, from laughter as well. So, and I was just like, it just, it struck a chord and I don't really know why it struck a chord so deeply, but um, I just became fascinated on how the mind affects our physical health. Um, and, you know, throughout my twenties, I grew up acting and I always, um, you know, I was kind of seeking like figuring out, I, you know, what, what was blocking me from having the career that I wanted or making me self-conscious. Like what were these subconscious? Did I have any past trauma? Did I have like past life stuff? So I was kind of like into woo woo there and seeking healers and therapists and different modalities to kind of remove blocks so that I could have a more successful career. So, so many different things along my way, i um, led down this path. And then, you know, once I saw the secret and once I started going to agape and reading br- books, you know, by Bruce Lipton, like the biology of belief, I was just like, Oh my God, everyone needs to know this. And I love that and, book. Uh, it was just like such, I just, I was like, how we we're not victims of our genes, you know? Um, and so people started coming to me in my personal life and they were like, you know, how are you manifesting this stuff? Or why, how are you so happy? Or why are you so healthy? Or tell me what you do. I just want to do everything you do. And so, you know, ultimately I was just like, growing up in entertainment, you know, film was the powerful medium for storytelling. And, and I was like, I just want to put all these teachers that empowered me into a film so that, you know, people can just watch the film and and know what I practice in my life. You know, can I ask you a question as, as an actor? Yeah. Um, it, so when you were talking about the secret and then you went on about how you grew up with acting. So I'm, I'm not an actor by any means, but I am interested and fascinated because when I first heard about the secret and the law of attraction, I was wondering if you're like a, an actor that perhaps uses more of a method acting technique. Do you feel like that seeps into your, your quantum level of healing? Like if you're playing a role like, like Heath Ledger, perhaps as an example, where that right. just completely screws you up, it, does that go against the the you know the philosophy of healing through quantum energy if you're purposely putting yourself into a, a negative state right i think that is such a fascinating question that i definitely kind of thought of and explored and i don't know i don't know the total truth around that i feel like you know if you're conscious enough and you have and if you're if you go into something and that's your technique and you just have to, you know, get into that feeling and get into that mindset and that lifestyle for a period of time to fully become the character. Um, I do believe it has an effect on you, but I don't believe that it has an irreversible effect. And I also believe that if you set intentions around it um, and go into it consciously, like you can perhaps protect yourself yeah. uh, a little bit more than just kind of diving in and not really having any sort of awareness of, of how that's going to trickle out and trickle down into your physicality and physical health and, and in your life. So I, I do believe definitely it has an effect if you're, if you're, you know, encompassing the thoughts of the character and the actions and the behaviors like that's vibration and that's stress and negative emotion and all of that stuff that could definitely affect your biology. So I actually had the opposite. I thought you were going to ask the opposite question that if you're like, an actor, are you more capable of pretending like it, like faking the gratitude? You know what I mean? Like okay. you can actually yeah. like have you have an easier ability to like shift into that headspace. Yeah. Like pretend you have it all. Pretend like the pretending is used. You're normal. Like you're used to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I guess it would work in both 
direction. That actually, I was going to save this for later, but that sort of like goes into a question that I, I really wanted to ask you. So now that you're like kind of thrust into the spotlight from this like, documentary you created, this guy kind of goes off what Chelsea was just saying. Do you feel like an internal pressure to like now I have to be this like perfect, perfect spiritual being? And like if you're in traffic and you flick someone off in a moment of, <laughs> of rage, you're like, oh, shit, I hope no one saw me do that because I'm the spiritual lady now. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. Wait, do you have a camera in my car? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. It's funny. I, I allow myself, you know, humanity, but I'm also more aware. So like, you know, I grew up in LA, so I've been driving on these streets, these rough streets of LA for many years. <laughs> and um, listening I, to Snoop Dogg, yeah, I listen to Snoop for sure. I grew up in the LVC, um, <laughs> so I I allow myself to like express, but I don't get caught up in you know the quote unquote rage or the emotion. Like I, it's almost comical. I watch myself, and like people have fun with me driving because they yeah. they watch me like kind of talk shit or, or, or vent, <laughs> vent in a way like, are you kidding you moron? You know, but, mm-hmm. but then you don't let it overtake you. It's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's almost like not a reaction. It's more like just yeah. kind of a like comical dialogue. But part of, part of your like Asana involves a middle finger occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> Mine yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I still, you know, I still get caught. I still get overwhelmed um, with stress sometimes. I still get caught up in family drama and, um, but I don't get, held under the grip for too long. I have tools, I have people I can talk to and I have, you know, so much awareness now that I can I can self-reflect um a lot easier. So I I I'm still very human. I just think that the the time I'm caught up in it is is drastically shortened. So, I have to ask this just because this is like this is that super untrend thing that I have to ask is what was it like being with the medical medium? Was this like was this relationship you had prior or you set it up for this documentary? Yeah, so actually medical medium wasn't even on my radar when I first set out and had my kind of list of of dream experts. Um I went to I I reached out to Chris Christian Northrup and because yes. I wanted to put a lot of female experts as many as I could in the film. Yeah. Um, and she wasn't available, but she said, you know, she was so lovely. I, you know, we just, she we hopped on the phone. And she's like, I'm not available, you know, in that window that you're coming to the East coast to film, but, um, you should check out medical medium, um, Kelly Brogan, the holistic psychiatrist and Kelly Turner for uh, the author of radical remission. Oh, okay. Three people that I think are just you know, so critical for the film um, and so amazing in their work. And so she put them all on my radar. I contacted them. They all said yes. And we shot, we filmed them in New York. And um, so it was just, it was just really cool because now, you know, Anthony William is helping so many people with these chronic mystery illnesses that are popping up left and right. And uh, I'm just so grateful that he suggested my film. And he's really helping celery farmers, I imagine. (laughs) (laughs) It's so funny. I know this whole celery juice craze is like, just is mind blowing. Like there was probably like a stock play there that like the guy from Billions could have really like capitalized (laughs) on. Celery's coming in hot. Seriously. (laughs) Well, it's funny because literally like, so in a, we live in a fairly small beach town, like we're in a little small area and we have one Whole Foods within about 30 miles and like it's been sold out of celery for like, like we all know the delivery day now. <laughs> it's like insane, isn't it? it? And like, you know, I called him, I was on vacation in Maui, which is like my happy place. And the Four Seasons had like vats of celery juice waiting for people to come. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like enough people are ordering, this is over Christmas break. Enough people are ordering straight up celery juice now that they have it like on the ready. This is crazy. So I texted him. I was like, are you, this is insane. I'm like, you need to figure out how to like capitalize. I know, but that's like his whole thing is like, he resists that. It's like so many people are saying add our, add our mix to it and may, and they want to make money. And he's like, nope, just celery juice. That's it. Yeah. So interesting. I just picture like, um, like carrot farmers, like trying to slip him some bribes (laughs) and be like, (laughs) Hey bro, carrots are the next thing, dude. Come on. Right. Exactly. Well, so was it, I mean, he was spot on when he saw you, huh? Was that a pretty surreal experience? With your it like, was. spinal it stuff? It was so crazy. I mean, um, the, you know, I, I, I don't know if you picked it up in the film, but he was like, you know, I thought you had a heart murmur. And it's, I mean, this is something that no, no one would know about me, but like my, 
my internist slash integrative medicine doctor used to be a cardiologist and he picked up like an irregular heartbeat. And he was like the second doctor in my lifetime to say that. And, and he's, Whoa. you know, we did the EKG and everything was fine. He's just said, you have like double jointed valves. So every now and then, you know, every like four or five months, my heart will like skip a beat. And I'm like, Oh, it's like a cramp for like a, a second. Oh. But for him to pick up on that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's like something no one would know, you know? That's pretty cool to hear, though. Those are like the things you need to hear when you're with someone like that, that you're like, give me the like for sure stuff that I can prove yeah. you right, you know? Exactly. Cool. Awesome. So, yeah. So with – um, you were mentioning Bruce Lipton before, and like I got into his book, um, Biology Belief, uh, probably about the same time. And then I read another one of his books after – I for- the title slips my mind. And – I loved the book, but what I didn't like about it when I got to the end and I actually tweeted him after to find out some information and he never got back to me, um, (laughs) was like, everything makes sense. Like the whole field of epigenetics and that you can turn on and turn off your genes. Everything is so logical and so magical, but then he never really like said, but here's how you do it. And what I loved about your documentary was that you gave this giant toolbox of stuff that you can actually apply because I felt like his book kind of lacked that. Like it made you believe everything. And I was waiting to the last page of his book, waiting for the secret. And like, here's how you turn off and on your genes. But like, <laughs> what I, I love that your documentary did that. And I love that you did it in a way where it was like, none of these are the way. Like emotional freedom technique or, you know, neurofeedback or sound therapy. You gave so many things, meditation. And then there you are like meditating on this like cart flying by in the street for like for humor. (laughs) And it was like, I love it because I think so many people get lost because they don't know where to start or they don't know which one is right or which one is wrong. And I, I think it was great how you framed it about none of these are the way you just kind of have to tap into that energy and really believe in whatever works for you. Can you talk upon that? Because I feel like a lot of people have no clue where to start, if it's real, or maybe they heard an anecdotal story for it didn't work for someone. I'm right. sure you get stuff like that. So how can you address that? Yeah. So I feel like, again, going back to the secret, I, you know, I like the couple of things that I took from that. Like one of the things that I took from that is I started gratitude journaling after that. And, um, I did. I think I learned it from Bob, Bob Proctor and the secret or whatever, but I would write in my journal, like things I was grateful for, and then write, um, things that I was grateful for that I weren't exactly a reality yet, but I, I wrote it down as if it already was a reality. And I started doing this and I, you know, like within three months, like crazy stuff was happening in my life. And I was like, Oh my God, this really works. Like what? what was crazy happening in my life. Yeah. Any example? Um, like for instance, I was, I think I was 20, 20, 27 at the time, 28. And, um, and I was cocktail waitressing, but it was really waitressing, but it was just in a bar of this really nice restaurant in LA making good money. But like, I only, you know, I could support myself on three nights a week, waiting tables and then, um, acting, you know, and, and all of a sudden in three months, I booked this job that I didn't even know existed, which I thought was so crazy at the time because I didn't know the job existed. And I went from, you know, barely getting by like paycheck to paycheck, just working the minimum amount I, I had to at this restaurant because I didn't want to get burnt out to I became a fit model for guests, which is basically they try their genes on me and my proportions were correct. And they would, you know, make their genes based on my my, I'm like a live mannequin. And I didn't even know this job existed, but I booked it. I'd never even gone on a casting like this before. And, you know, within three months I was making over six figures, you wow. know, like, and I was like, okay, well, wow. this stuff really works. Yeah. So that was, that was probably the biggest thing, but you know, my life, my life kind of changed, but, um, so, so basically with heal, I wanted to say like, everybody's different. Everyone's background is different. Everyone's, you know, culture and perception of life is different. And I just want to kind of, it's almost like 101, like just flip on the switch of awareness and like serve a platter of like kind of what's out there, you know, and, and you, the viewer, see, see what resonates with you. And then you go dive deeper down that path. You know what I mean? There's only so much you can pack into a documentary in an hour and a half hour and 45 minutes. So here's serving up a tray and you just kind of if you were really moved by the EFT or, you know, if someone's been telling you to meditate for years and this is finally like the thing that got you over the edge, then then great. So just 
here's kind of what's out there. You find what resonates with you. Well, so with that path, was there any of these things that um, were new to you or like shocking in the sense of like, whoa, I've never done this. And this really seems like it's like it really works. I was really fascinated by Dr. Jeffrey Thompson um, and the sound healing because yeah. he's such a mad scientist genius, you know? That's the one that got us too. I never saw that, that before. Cool. I really wanted to like buy an app with those headphones. <laughs> it looks so cool. <laughs> totally. And he makes like a chair that you can sit in. Like when we went down to San Diego, we sat in the chair and you can put the headsets on and some sort of colored glasses and you sit in the chair and it's like the vibrations going into your body and then the the by neural beats are going into your thing and it's this whole like reset of your nervous system and it's awesome and um and just for him to be smart enough to figure that out and combine science and technology and woo woo and uh and to really to be able to measure what frequency causes someone's body to push in the clutch and go from paras or go from sympathetic nervous system fight or flight to parasympathetic nervous system rest and repair is like so cool, you know, so, yeah. um, and, and to, for him to demonstrate that, that my friend Eva was constantly in a state of stress, even when she was quote unquote, you know, lying in a bed, relaxed, like her, her body was still on overdrive in, in, you know, first gear. Yeah. So I just thought that was super cool. So there's two topics here I want to cover. One, I want to ask you about your friend Eva, because I have to say, like, I think, that was probably a journey you were hoping would go the other way. No. <laughs> oh yeah. Of yeah. Course. <laughs> so, but I love the metaphor of it. Cause I think that's common. That's like what, you know, we can be handed prednisone and have a quick fix. And, and that's hard to fight against when you're like, the answer is right there. It's so easy. Um, yeah. but does she, are, are, do you, you kept it in there because you felt like, what was the purpose of it staying in there? Well, you know, I, I think the purpose was to demonstrate like here she is, I don't want to say victim, but like she's a good example of, you know, our medical system, why it's hooking people into this quick fix. And, you know, based on her survival, I mean, she's got a full-time job. She's got three kids and she is, you know, she's just doing what she has to do to survive and get through the day. Um, And and I think that, so I kept it in there because I didn't want it, you know, documentary. It's like not everything should be wrapped up perfectly with a bow. She's, she's, I, when I first started working with her, um, she had never, you know, she had never done any emotional work. She had never done any sort of kind of holistic exploration, you know? And yeah. like she was telling me her brother did a lot of work around the mom situation and her childhood, their childhood trauma and stuff. And she hadn't really gone there yet. She just didn't have the time. And and she's just a fighter. She just bulldogs, you know, bulldozes yeah. through everything. Um, so so I think she's a good indication too. Like that EFT session with Patty was her first, you know, holistic therapy. It was her first cracking open. And I I just think that some people, you know, I've I've been on 20 years of seeking and doing personal work and she's just starting on that journey. So for some people, healing can like take place in an instant. And for some people, it's going to take a few years just to peel back the layers and really get to where you need to go. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I also saw it as like, I like that, um, that balance, like it makes me think, so like we told you our kids have the flu right now and it makes me think about like, you know, I'm a big believer in, let the fever fight it. And we're going to, we're going to do everything we can, like get them some fresh air. We're doing everything natural and crunchy possible. But the truth is, is like when my daughter is completely losing it, like that's what Motrin is for. (laughs) So it's like that balance of like, we can do all these things. Medicine's there for a purpose, but let's not use it as like a full on crutch. Right. So it's like balancing out and you can keep developing just because you take the medicine doesn't mean that journey's over, which I like that story. Exactly. Exactly. And finding that balance of like, you you know, relying on the medicine just to like, you know, get over the hump or stop the proverbial bleeding, you know, in a very acute case, but then, you know, to really heal anything chronic, um, you got to do the work, you know? I know it's fascinating in our area because it's like the, um, our big issue here is like Lyme's disease is completely out of control. Like everyone has Lyme's, Mm -hmm. um, but people are being diagnosed with like the rheumatoid arthritis with 
you know, uh, just various autoimmune diseases. And then it really comes to find its limes in the long run. And I do have to wonder, like, how much of this can be helped with a lot of these tools. Totally. Yeah, exactly. And that's the the kind of weird thing about this whole autoimmune, you know, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Lyme, all these, all these different things can kind of chronic pain and all the, uh, they, they cross over each other and it just kind of depends on which specialist you go to is what diagnosis you end, end up with, you know? I think what's like really interesting about these topics also is the way that you kind of married together the science with the woo-woo stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm like picturing people like my parents who would watch just like a woo-woo topic like this and they're like, oh, there you go, Jay, you're being, you know, you're being a crunchy granola hippie <laughs> again. But it's like when you see someone like, you know, doctors, Joe Dispenza, who I'm like super into, or people like that, that really um, make sense of it all. Like you realize like science and the quantum field and quantum healing and all this woo woo stuff is actually one and the same. They're not really in separate corners of the ring as, as they're made out to be. Were there, were there any moments in particular or things during the making of this that really really made that even more cohesive for you or things you've heard from people that have watched it that were like, I didn't know that, you know, these things were really related. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just, it's like science is now being able to kind of prove quantum physics and, and all these new sciences are proving what ancient wisdom has kind of been demonstrating for, and, you know, ancient medicine has been, demonstrating for thousands of years, you know, acupuncture and all these things that, you know, have been around and successful in meditation. And, and now quantum physics can, can show and demonstrate with, with different, you know, different scientific and measurable instruments that like Joe Dispenza does in his workshops and everything, um, you know, the energy and the connection and, and, and how all of these things work. So I think that like new science is kind of, that's what, that's why we, we all kind of laugh. It's like alternative he healing has been around and working for <laughs> thousands and thousands of years. You know what I mean? Modern medicine is only however many years old. So um, it's a funny way for people to look at it, but, but I just love, yeah. So new science is kind of proving that all this stuff that has been around for thousands of years works and why it works. Yeah. Well, so I wanted to, we were like touching upon this before we hopped on, but I actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about the hypnobirthing stuff on here, because when you talk about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerve, that's literally like the first class of hypnobirthing. We talk about how you're only supposed to exist in your sympathetic nerve, like that system for 5% of your time, like overall. Mm -hmm. And okay. the goal truly of hypnobirthing is like, how can we program the brain to remain in the parasympathetic space when it's going through something that can be defined as trauma if it shifts into the other place? So it's actually like shifting into that full control over your thoughts and really like avoiding getting everything pulled out of the frontal lobe into that space of fight or flight. Like, okay, I'm now defining what's going on as like, like a trauma really is what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. But it's fascinating because it's all done with hypnobirthing through hypnosis. And it kind of opened my eyes. I was sitting there thinking like, so I believe in the hypnosis for birth, but then I wonder what things like EFT and meditation, you know, like all these other things that can do that same thing. I wonder if for different people, clients of mine, different things would work in better ways, you know? Yeah. I mean, I feel like hypno birthing, I mean, that definitely resonates with me because, you know, you're going through this experience, especially if you're going through it for the first time that the whole world has told you is extremely traumatic and painful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that is your belief system, you know, that you kind of adopt as a woman, um, unless you're raised kind of on a place where everybody gets... a hippie commune that's the only place that exists yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so um so it's it's doing whatever you can. like i feel like hypnosis is a really strong and powerful way to kind of get to that subconscious belief system or switch your perception to go okay this is something that body does naturally these are this is not pain it's just sense you know pain is not you know pain usually indicates like a problem and breakdown um, 
uh, a wound of some sort, but yeah. this is like a natural process of the body. And these are just actual very intense sensations. So all this reframing um, around it so that you can get back into that parasympathetic um, nervous system and, and just use your breath and, and your mind to keep you calm and, and, and surrender to like this natural process, even though it's super intense, rather than going to, holy shit, this is scary, (laughs) you know, fight or flight. So like, I feel like, I mean, there probably is other modalities. I I think like hypnobirthing gets to like the root subconscious. Yeah. And And what's really like, what's so interesting about like, as you're saying that, like that, um, that fight or flight space, the way that it represents, like I can only can, I really like birth is my space. So that's like what I can compare everything to. But like, you know, I'll notice the fight or flight response in people in other realms. But for the most part, I see it in birth. And the way that it comes up is so fascinating. Like there's no one way. Like I have women that will be like, I just need everything to stop. And it's like they're (laughs) like about to crown, like a baby's coming. And it's like, I just want everything to stop. Like everyone be quiet. I want everything to stop. I want to go like out for lunch. Like I'm done. They just full on <laughs> shut down. It's wild. And then other people are like, that's when they flail and that's when they get scared. And it's like getting control over that one space. But really the fight or flight response really only comes right at the end of labor. So it's so fascinating because it's actually a giant cue that the natural birthers know is coming and like they'll really be ready for it and they can define it. But if you're not, if you're on anything like Pitocin or anything that's kind of causing these artificial things to happen, it's all mixed up. And that's why we get so confused with labor because it's like now things are being artificially stimulated, you know, so nothing is responding properly. So what's interesting is that it parallels all those other things like these autoimmune diseases and all this stuff. It's like when medicine is introduced, we're kind of mimicking things that is we're not properly responding. Does that make sense? It totally does. Everything's connected and all these systems that were brilliantly designed to work together, um, you know, when an intervention is, is applied, like it, it throws off the communication and this kind of intricate balance that, that nature relies on, you know? So it's like, once you, you know, I was reading and you know, you're, you're way more of an expert and can speak to this than, than I can, but I want to attempt a natural birth because a, our bodies were designed to do it. And, um, B, I just, I, you know, I want to, I'm, I'm like an athlete. Like I, you got this. I want to, yeah. I also have a <laughs> terrible fear of hospitals and, yeah. and needles. So well, plus um, you're like that heel lady. So you have to, you have to do it. <laughs> so, I know. Yeah, exactly. I'm supposed to be really natural. <laughs> um, but you know what I was reading about, like in that, when you, your body is producing its own endorphins and neurochemicals to, to lessen the pain and get you through it. I mean, that's just the way the whole process is designed. So when you introduce an epidural, your brain shuts that off. Yes. Um, your natural endorphin. So you're actually like, you know, whereas you might be kind of in a trance in the natural labor part, uh, once you apply the intervention in the epidural or the drugs, your body shuts off the natural drugs. And so you're much more, yeah, that trance disappears and you're kind of actually much more like heightened and stressed, you know? Yes. And that comes back to that emotional stuff, which was what spoke to me so much in, as I was listening to the documentary, because I felt like that's what I was thinking about is like, yes, we might be numbing the pain, but like emotionally, we're not allowing it to naturally do what it needs to do. So we are actually, it's, it's scarier. The amount of people that I have that will get the epidural and then they're suddenly like, oh my God, I can't move my legs. I forgot that that was going to happen. What did I just do? Like they just have this moment and then it's like, we have to go back to hypnobirthing and bring me, bring you back. Like, it's okay. People get epidurals. It's acceptable. But there is that, there's a new plan in place as far as like doula and birth helper work goes. Cause now you're dealing with that side of it for sure. That intense emotional side. Yeah. And it's wonderful. We have these like inventions. It's wonderful. We have steroids for people like Eva who are in taking the emergency room or, or an epidural for, you know, or Pitocin for someone that their birth stalled or some sort of emergency yeah. acute situation. It's just, we've kind of tipped the scale where people are taking that convenient, painless, you know, route. And all of these things are going to, you know, eventually have side effects on the way nature is working. Yeah, they already are for sure. Yeah. That's yeah. not, that's absolutely true. I was looking for, um, some direct takeaways because I know in my family, I have a couple stubborn uh, parents who like this stuff is just over their heads. So selfishly, I'm going to ask, are there ways that you found to deal with such people, whether it's family members or friends that are just like, Kelly, you are like off the charts, crunchy, 
this stuff is like phony baloney is there is there a good kind of runway to take people off on that you found gets people into this way of thinking without sounding too like woo well yeah even with the documentary you figure there's the audience that <coughs> That Netflix is recommending this to, that we're already going to watch it. How do you introduce right. it to the rest of the world? Yeah, you know, um, I still haven't cracked that code. It's really frustrating. <laughs> do you have people that you're close to that are just like completely on the other side of the spectrum? Yeah. And I just basically, you know, I apply it to political conversations as well. I just, yeah. just like instead of reacting or instead of getting defensive, I just, I've now just kind of taken you know, laugh, like laughter. Like I like, I just don't get engaged in a debate. Um, I try to, you know, depending on their, uh, level of stubbornness. Like I know people that are just, they think they know everything and that's, this is their way of thinking. And I just, I just don't even expend any energy trying to convince them otherwise, whether it's political or this topic, but yeah. I it, have this such deep inherent knowing is the truth of the capital T. Um, it's just like, you just have to let people, you know, and I, and I talked to what's the the heaviest and the the hardest is when someone is actually going through something medically and you know that you can help them and kind of bring them around to awareness of emotional work that they might want to touch on. And, and they're just, for whatever the reason, they just don't want to hear it. They're not open to it. And they're going down this path that is not going to end well. And, yeah. and that's, that's the hardest time. And I've, you know, I've seen people like get so frustrated. They can't help their parent dying of cancer because whatever. So it's just, you just have to trust life and you kind of have to just let go and you just do your best by leading by example and kind of gently lobbing up suggestions. And that's, that's kind of all you can do. Yeah. That's, that's like the tough part with these things. Like when you see someone that you love or care about and they just don't acknowledge the fact that nutrition and habits and mindset have anything to do with health and well-being. And you're looking at them with such love and caring and you're like, just wake up, you know, and you don't want to come across as trying to act superior. You're not trying to be the alpha in their room. You're just like, I genuinely love you and want to take care of you and help you. I wish you would just blank and it's that's that's a tough part i guess to take your ego out of that and just realize that you're only in control of of just so many things in your life exactly exactly you lead a horse to water but yes, you can't make yeah. him drink you know that, that said you did have um i actually took a screenshot of it last night because we were we were watching again the documentary and there was a part where you where you guys were talking about how there's a lot of habits and mindsets and different things. But what there was, was her name? The girl, that, the redhead that did the, she had like the nine things in common. I just want to get oh, her yeah, name Kelly, right. Kelly Turner. That's Kelly, Kelly Turner. Turner. There okay. you go. So I took a screenshot of it and I found it really interesting because you narrowed it down to certain, I guess it was nine. I don't want to count. It was, I think it was yeah. nine. around nine yeah. things. And it was um, <laughs> radically changing your diet, taking control of your health, following your intuition, using herbs and supplements, releasing suppressed emotions increasing positive emotions, embracing social support, deepening your spiritual connection, have a strong reason for living. And and from what I understood, these are basically the overlapping things across the spectrum of- For radical remission, for right? radical remission, drastic changes of every age, different ethnicities. This is pretty much what you believe to be like as much of a quote unquote secret to this as, as you found? Yeah, so this is like directly applies to Kelly Turner's research with in regards to cancer. And she said, you know, of the 1500 people that she interviewed and cases she studied of people that, you know, basically were sent home to die, but they healed. Uh, these were, not, they all did some version of these nine things. So it's like the formula for, you know, doing remarkable healing. And I just think it's so fascinating because I don't think it applies just to cancer. I think it applies to any chronic illness. Um, and I, and I think it's such a beautiful metaphor for the work because only two out of the nine are physical, which is mm. diet, radically changing diet and using herbs and supplements. Um, and the rest are most emotional, mental, and spiritual. So, I, and I feel like that's just such a beautiful picture of like the ratio of how you need to kind of approach your healing journey. Like, yes, you need to, to, you know, address the physical and, and deal with it. But, but like the majority of the work is going to be mental, emotional, and spiritual. Do you feel like these are like 
these things are like kind of chained together together vertically where like one is dependent on the other. Like if you are completely screwing up your supplements or your diet, but you're doing other things right, like you're just going to, it's all or nothing. Like, do you feel how, how interconnected and necessary are, are each of these to, to work? You know, I think you could, there's different scales of, of kind of um, the need to address depending on the person, you know, if, if someone's, I think you can, so it, it's the, the answer. There's no one blanket answer, yeah. but like, I know for sure, you know, and, and Kelly Brogan, um, the holistic psychiatrist, a lot of Kelly's in this film. Yeah, there <laughs> were. <biased> <laughs> the name. Um, I love the name. Um, so she, she starts out her mental health patients and to get them off medication, she makes them go through an intense, um, diet change and kind of lifestyle change. And so kind of, she looks at diet as the foundation. And then once you clean up the gut and you clean up the diet, um, then you can get back down to like a homeostasis, like a baseline of, of, of where you can gauge the mental health more accurately because our gut health is intricately connected to our emotional health. And if we are putting crappy food and processed food and Franken food into our body, we are going to have poor mental health, you know? Yeah. So, so I do believe that like, you know, they all kind of intermix, but like I do, I personally believe that changing your physical diet affects your mental health tremendously and your emotional health. So you're, you're much more likely to be able to do the other things. If you have a baseline diet of just natural, more natural foods, like whole foods in the way that we're meant to eat, you know, not processed packaged foods. So <clears throat> did any of them or do you have an opinion on this new like the IV trend of like doing the IV supplements? Like, is this just a band aid like that people are doing so they don't have to change the rest of their their stuff? Or is this like, is this helpful? Like, are you seeing people with good results from these? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think so. I, I went, to, you know, I was diagnosed with mold and Lyme, actually. Um, oof, four years ago now, like, you know, and I didn't want to talk about my Lyme because I wasn't experiencing any acute symptoms. And I know a lot of people have gnarly, gnarly symptoms and neurological symptoms. So for me, you know, in my twenties, I've always, you know, I had brain fog and, you know, acid reflux and all these things that were like, I just attributed to a hard partying, not, not (laughs) hard partying, but like a go, go, go. Yeah, of course. It's okay. Hard partying is allowed. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Snoop Dogg. You can't deny it. Come on. That's going to be the only quote we pull from this. Exactly. She listens to Snoop Dogg and parties hard. But <laughs> So um, I just chalked it up to that. So I, but once, so long story short is I went, um, my doctor, when he died, when, when he did this full blood panel and he found out that I was like stricken with mold which I remember the apartment I lived in, in my early twenties that had like black mold. I just, again, wasn't educated, didn't have the awareness that once you move out of that destructive environment, like that mold stays and kind of flourishes in your body and and starts to wipe out your immune system. So now that I knew it was in my system, he suggested we um, do IVs of high doses of vitamin C and glutathione. So I did that. And I also went to um, John of God, which is very controversial right now. But, um, uh, so, and he suggested even before treating the mold that I go to Germany because he said, that's where they treat Lyme the best. And, you know, he's like, you should do three weeks of antibiotics. And I was like, hold on a second. I'm not experiencing crazy Lyme symptoms. I don't, I, I intuitively feel like if, if I do in fact have Lyme, I picked it up many years ago. You know, there's been a couple instances where I've, I've been in nature, I've been in wilderness, I've been camping or whatever, and I've been sick right after, but I don't ever remember like a, a bullseye sign or a tick. Um, but I go, I don't think this happened overnight. So I've had it in my system for a long time. And so I said, let's, let's not go the antibiotics until something progresses. And let's just focus on the mold for now, one thing at a time. So I did like six months of IVs, you know, he wanted me to come in twice a week. I basically came in like every other week. Yeah. And, (laughs) and after that six months, we retested my blood again. The mold was significantly lower and the Lyme was gone. So, so what else did you change? Cause I'm sure you were doing other things too. 
I was eating well. I was exercising, um, meditating. I was doing all those those things. You yeah. know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I can't remember like what else I was doing. Um, yeah, but to see that it makes that much help is a big deal, and that's just the vitamin D and the what was the. Glutamine. It was vitamin C and glutathione. glutathione. And, you know, but then like every other IV, I would get like a Myers cocktail of vitamin Bs and, okay. and everything else good for you. Um, but I do feel like the glutathione like pulls out a lot of toxins um, and the vitamin C is kind of this universal amazing It sounds like you were doing like you're, you're on a habitual pattern of like doing all these cool things like doing the right things. And there was a story, I think her name was Elizabeth with stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what kind of like took me by that, which I think a lot of, a lot of people that are sort of on the other end of the spectrum than, than us collectively are the ones like my dad's always using the thing like, Oh, there was a story of this guy that used to run marathons and he was a a vegetarian and he died of heart. He died of a heart attack. (laughs) And there's like that, that side of this where people are like, yeah, well you only live once. So you might as well just do whatever. And my grandma smoked cigarettes until she was 110. Yeah. Yeah, Like those stories. Grandpa (laughs) smoked cigars and drank vodka and he's whatever. So there was someone, you know, someone like Elizabeth, who did yoga was eating healthy and there's people that are already doing like quote unquote the right things that still get sick and there's and there's children that get sick and it's Mm -hmm. like it seemed like from elizabeth's story like she was kind of um uh, holding in negative energy and there was like a spiritual um epigenetic aspect to it it's trying to like think how to word this question, but how do you reconcile that for people or people that are, that are maybe either deniers or skeptics or doubting. They're like, I'm I'm already eating salad. Uh, you know, I'm doing yoga, I'm doing whatever, and I'm still sick. Like, yeah, it's a fine line. I mean, there's, there's all these unseen toxins in the world and EMFs and crazy, you know, that everybody has all these pesticides in their system, even if they're eating organic. So it's, there's a lot of crazy kind of silent attackers out there. That's why you need to have all of these tools and spiritual practices and clean diet as much as possible. But I also think that like Elizabeth, I know for a fact, and it's, again, it's a fine line. You know, she did yoga, she did acupuncture. Um, She ate an insanely clean diet, all this stuff, but she, you know, her mom died of cancer. That was a lot of grief and fear around the actual disease of cancer. And then she was in a really unhealthy marriage. Um, and so while she was, you know, doing so many right things, she had a lot of subconscious emotional suppression um, or repression or whatever it was, you know, and also from her childhood uh, that was affecting her system, you know, yeah. and, and I think that could probably apply to a lot of, a lot of people. And, and you kind of mentioned it before, like all of these spiritual leaders or, health coaches or whatever, you know, because of what they do in their job, they have this kind of unrealistic pressure expectation on them that they have to be perfect. Um, And that, that expectation causes emotional stress and kind of inauthenticity um, and places that burden on them. So, you know, I, I see it all the time in girls that look, you know, look like they eat really healthy, but the amount of emotional stress that they feel when they're eating their salad Um, because they're so freaked out about their weight or about getting sick or whatever it is, um, you know, that emotional stress can be more damaging than if they had just eaten, you know, a handful of fries. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like the, um, the mechanistic nature of our bodies. You can, you can do so much with, I guess, the food intake and with the exercise and it's the, I guess it's the invisible enemies that are, that are probably the hardest to tackle. You take someone that that does all the right things, but like you said, you know, internally on a spiritual level, they're being tortured inside. And I, I think that's where meditation has has helped me quite a bit is like piecing together patterns of things that you didn't realize. And I've, I've been doing meditation a lot more seriously over the past couple of months, and I've definitely started to notice my awareness seep in from my meditative state to my awakened state. And I'm still like not even close to being perfect, but it is interesting to have that consciousness allow you to kind of take a peek under the hood at the software and realize Mm -hmm. all these things and all these activities and all these thoughts you have, they're sort of on autopilot until you say, wait a minute, I I have an ability to control what I'm thinking about and how these fears affect me. 
And it seems like from watching the documentary that meditation has done something similar for you. Can you speak on that? I can. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, the best way to put it is again, meditation is a practice. I, even the person who taught me meditation, he's, you know, goes through fluctuations of really deep, deep practice. And then where it's just kind of like going through the motions to kind of maintain where he's at, you know? And, um, and I feel like, you know, we're so inundated with technology and the internet and news. And we're just so inundated with so much information that we just haven't evolved. Our brains haven't evolved to like process yet. So uh, there's so much like, there's so much noise and chaos and, and information that's crowding our brain and um, and stress that we're just taking on every day, whether we're conscious of it or not. And so meditation just like pushes the reset button for me. It allows me to, you know, cut off that in, inundation of information and and also just release whatever whatever that buildup is to create space. And the more, the more you practice this, whether it's once a day or twice a day, um, the more space you create, you know, because it's like an accumulative um, buildup, you know, and the more, and, and as Peter Crone says so beautifully in the documentary, um, space is the precursor to healing. You know, you can't, it's like that hoarding of people in the garage, like that just energetically is not a healthy space, you know? So I feel like meditation for me has created space. It like releases trauma, energetic trauma and informational trauma and emotional trauma that builds up in the brain and the system and the physical tissues. It also just, again, with your breath uh, and with your eyes closed and you're shutting off yourself to all the sensory overload of the world um, and the information overload, you just quiet your mind so you can release and create stress. And then you become, you know, with space, you become less reactive to life. So all these, so then you have more ability and capacity to deal with what life throws at you every day. So it's a practice, but I feel like it's a cumulative practice. And um, so the more space you're creating on a regular basis, the more stress you can actually process, stress and information you can process without being triggered, you know, in your everyday life. So that's, that's what it's done for me. That's so cool. Have you, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chels. No, it's okay. I was just going to say, as you're talking, I was going to say that was like one of my favorite parts just overall of the documentary was how visual you guys were able, like everyone in it was able to make it like, you know, with like the attacking the cancer cells or like creating space with meditation. Like, I think that's what people need is an ability to understand why. And when you can visually like almost see it within your own body, it helps you work through the processes themselves, you know? Yeah, cool. I was going to add on the topic of meditation, I feel like that I first got into meditation through hypnosis, hypnotherapy. I I grew up being like having anxiety, like terrible anxiety, and I didn't even realize until college that that's not actually normal. Like you're not supposed (laughs) to have like your heart's not supposed to be beating out of your chest. You're not supposed (laughs) to be like panicked. And it's like idiotic. But it was like one of those things where I got into psychology class and I'm like, here's a chapter on anxiety and here's all the symptoms. I'm like, holy fuck, I have all that. And I got into hypnotherapy and I had some like incredible experiences and I I. I have had similar type of experiences through uh, meditation, and my my one of my therapists that I was going to was convinced and sort of convinced me that a lot of the trauma and anxiety may have been either triggered or a continuance of my uh, traumatic birth. I was born breech, and I, my mom told me that I was born like not breathing, and that trauma of my birth experience and whatnot and perhaps what was going on while I was in the womb and my parents were fighting with each other, like who knows, like that all had an impact on me. And that was sort of what, you know, got Chelsea and I, um, she's going to say, you're going to freak out a pregnant lady. (laughs) (laughs) No, 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 no. I'm sure you have a very, uh, (laughs) you know what? It's just like going through that and knowing how real it was. So I was going to, I'll say this first and then I'll get into that. But like a couple of the hypnobirthing experience or the hypnosis therapy, sessions I had and some of my meditative uh, states that I've gotten into feel like nothing other than me being in the womb, like a physical pressure all around me, a feeling of being held in tight in a physical sense. And when I was describing these feelings that only come a few times a year, 
um, to my therapist, she was like, do you realize this is what you're describing and blah, blah, blah. And she gave me this, this idea or this concept. What do you think about that? And I said, you know what, that makes a lot of sense. And like, that was partly what got Chelsea and I to do hypnobirthing for, um, when, when we were pregnant with our daughter summer. And have you had, um, experiences from meditation that kind of give you physical sensations that are beyond just like a meditative trance? Because I feel like a lot of people have um, experiences with meditation where they feel like they failed or they don't feel like they're in another state. And most meditation for me is more just the awareness that my brain is going rather than this crazy otherworldly state. But I do have, I have had experiences where I've seen patterns, I felt physical sensations. And while they are rare, they're very real. Have you had similar types of experiences at all? Yeah. And as you talk about it, I'm like, oh, it's like, it's pretty, it's pretty, well, for me, it did, I didn't feel pressure or like a thing. I, there's been a few, a handful of times and it's only a handful in the, however many years I've been meditating, eight, uh, 10 years, 11 years. Um, and you like, I, what, what it feels like for me is like, I'm very kind of, you know, relaxed in a meditative state. And then I literally just like, dip down where my heart it almost like feels like you're on a roller coaster and you just like dip deep below like you know it's it's it's, it's like you're out of your body for yeah, a minute that's cool. and it's yeah. literally only an instant but it's just this like deep dive into another realm kind of thing um and it it almost like feels like when you go there it's like this full power washing of of everything just like gets kind of exploded off of you and and then you come back and you're like whoa like you feel like you've rested for months you know yeah. and you get that deep kind of healing um but again i've probably can count it on one hand yeah. how many times i've experienced that little dip down into the other realm of of consciousness so it's or connection i guess to source or whatever you want to call it but yes. for the most part you know meditation isn't as profound it's just this like daily thing where i can when I, first, you know, especially if I'm meditating at the end of the day, I, you know, it takes you me a couple minutes to really relax. Like I'll sit down and the minute I close my eyes, I can literally, it, it's like my brain is going on, you know, first gear. It's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then like, it takes a two to three, five minutes to just through the breathing and through the mantra or through whatever technique I'm practicing that day to just really calm down and just like, okay, space, you know? So do you find like one of these techniques, like what Deepak was talking about, you know, all these different ways, do you find one is one that you go to as your like quick fix? Like this is always going to work for me. Um, let's see. I, I mean, I guess the mantra based is the one I go to the most, but if I'm being completely honest, if I'm kind of lazy or I'm super tired at the end of the day, I will do a guided meditation. And yeah. I feel like it it's just as effective. You know, I stick my headphones in and scroll through the many different the guided meditations. Joe Dispenza has one on my phone. He's got a few on my phone. Yeah, I have a couple from him. Do you have that one that's like the 45 minute one that's like opening the space in your chakras? Yep. Mm -hmm. Did you read his book, um, Becoming Superhuman? I haven't yet. Did you, during the making of your documentary, did you get a lot of time to chat with him about any of his stuff or was it more just like shooting the thing and then peace out? Shooting the thing and peace out, but okay. we we're, we're friends. He just, he actually just um, wrote the foreword to the heel book and just gave it to me yesterday. So I like oh, love this guy cool. and I'm just like, so I'm so fascinated by his work. And um, it kind of tripped me out. Like his book, um, Becoming Superhuman, he like, goes into these chapters where it's almost like he's he was like going through a past life of being like an ancient Roman soldier or something. And then he talks a lot about kind of acti activating like the third eye and having like this almost like chemical internal explosion where it kind of sets you into another world. And it was it was so fascinating and so interesting. It was it was on the fence. I was kind of on the fence of like, I really, really, really want to believe this, but it was almost far fetched. And I, I, I bought his meditations like immediately afterwards, because I was like, I want to experience that yeah, wherever he's going, take me with you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, he's 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 I love it. I I like I can talk to him for hours and weeks. And he's just so in tune. And so just 
uh, the work he's doing is amazing. I mean, he was just describing uh, that what he does in these advanced workshops and how he like teaches these people meditation for a whole week. And then on the final day, they do these kind of um, group healings where eight people will get around one person that needs the healing the most physically and they'll put him in the middle and then they get into a meditative state and they're just like throwing their intention into the field and they're all just creating this like vortex of of this quantum healing energy yeah. and, and he's like describing how the people in the middle they're you know, energetically, like their whole body is almost levitating or twitching or whatever. Like they're just, they're literally affecting quantum energy on a quantum level and like recalibrating the cells of their body. And I'm just like, this is so cool. Yeah. I want to do his workshop so bad. Do you find that you're more intrigued and pulled towards being the healer role? Or do you find more interest and intrigue with being the one that is healed, even if it's something that you don't realize you need healing for? Um, I feel like both. Mostly, I, I mean, I, I feel like the more work I do on myself and the more I'm quote unquote healed and work with these people, the more I can hold space and like, you know, help facilitate other people's healing. Um, I feel like, you know, a lot of, especially since the film has been out, like a lot of people come to me for advice and there's just only so much energy you have in a day to work with people. So I feel like, you know, and I just don't have the answers for everybody. There's, there's yeah. people I know of that I've worked with and there's, so I wish like, it's just, it feels, um, I don't know. It's, it's a tough thing. Like the, 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 the the role of a healer comes with a big kind of responsibility and um, that's tough, you know, it weighs on you when you can't help everybody, you know? Yes, absolutely. So I agree. But the more I, the more I find healing in myself, the more I work on myself and continue to grow and evolve. Like, you know, I love to just hold that space for other people to, to guide them. And, and that's the other thing with meditation. It's like the more space you create, the more your intuitive um, higher self and, and, and intuition can help guide yourself and, and other people in the moment. You yeah. It's clearer. The one thing that I did, um, want to ask was we, you kind of like dabbled there during the documentary, but it's always sort of interested me actually, even in like some of the education for hypnobirthing, we talk about what, um, sort of like that deep genetic past, the things that sort of exist in us that we don't even really know about. And I would love to just hear your take on that part of the healing when we might be healing things generationally that aren't even our baggage. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a whole wild thing. Like I've, you know, I've worked with so many different kinds of healers and, and my actual, my Pilates teachers exploring past lives past lives right now and we're hypnotherapists shamans and you know a lot of them have brought up different past lives that I've um that may or may not be affecting me now you know yeah. or uh, so I I do it's it's hard for me to really ever know um and also like Rob Worgen the energy healer that's in the film he's like when I work with you I'm healing seven generations back and seven generations forward, you know? So I'm fascinated by it all. Like I don't, yeah. I don't really understand it, but it does resonate with me at times, sometimes more than others. And I, I, I do feel like just like Jay's like traumatic birth, you know, we are, we are being imprinted um, by our ancestry and our, and our parents and our caregivers and our, and our, you know, even as far back as in utero. Um, you know, and beyond and before. So yeah. I think it all plays a role. I just, I, I just, it's hard for me to kind of like comprehend and fathom. And I love working with people that have that kind of um, ability to channel that information, Yes, you know, because yeah. sometimes it really does resonate and you're like, whoa, that makes a lot of sense. And, and just that awareness or just that kind of story helps you heal in some way. We just had a um, an astrophysicist on last week, and it was tripping me out because we we got into the topic of quantum physics, which I think we're all fascinated by collectively. And the whole idea of us all being made of, of vibrating 
fields of energy. It's just it's just fascinating to realize that there's some sort of life force energy in everything, even in a rock. Like it wouldn't be visible to us. It wouldn't be matter if it wasn't vibrating. And like that idea of a collective unconscious doesn't seem that odd in a scientific level when you realize that nothing can be created nor destroyed. We're all just kind of recycled stardust when it comes down to it. It's it is really like a super fascinating topic. I think going back onto the parenting thing, I think that was one of the insights that I had becoming a dad is realizing that this is my opportunity to raise healthy children and to kind of break old patterns on on mm-hmm. many different levels. And I think that's it's such a responsibility for a parent to take on uh, in a responsible and spiritual way to realize that you have an ability to break patterns, create new ones, upgrade your software, so to say. Do you sort of feel like that responsibility now with uh, being pregnant and going through this? Totally, totally. And, you know, I'm I'm almost 40. I'll be 40 when I give birth. Um, so I do feel like I'm in a place in my life where I can be a much more conscious parent than I would have been if I had had a child earlier. But I've always been kind of aware of patterns in my parents that I don't want. And I have, I have lovely parents. I'm sure we all do. Um, but but there's patterns that you you can see that they've kind of adopted from their parents and so mm-hmm. on and so forth and patterns that I, I don't care to pass on. So um, yeah, I believe that like, and it's cool, you know, I feel like just universally energy is speeding up, consciousness is is being raised and um it's just a cool time to have a kid and 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 like everything and like every experience i feel is for the evolution of our individual soul and our consciousness like parenting's got to be one of the biggest teachers and and places and arenas where you can apply that consciousness and apply that work so yeah it's it's like it's a, i'm excited well, you're ahead of the game if you're already seeing that, you know, that process starts now. So good job. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm like, and again, it's that fine line of going, okay, I know that everything that I'm feeling and going through and being exposed to right now is affecting the development of my child emotionally and, you know, neurologically and physically. And, you know, but then not to stress out about that, you know, too much like going, okay, but there's buffers, you know, there's physical buffers and like, you don't, you don't want to stress too much about it, but you want to be aware of it. You want to be conscious of it. So you can make kind of the highest choices for yourself and, and the little, little being growing inside. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, so I'll tell you exactly what my hypnobirthing teacher told me, which now I tell my students is that, um, it's crazy to think that you would just be stress-free during your whole pregnancy. It doesn't happen. But when you give yourself that ability to understand that you actually want those little stresses because you're teaching a baby how you heal from them, like you're actually teaching them the ebbs and flows and how to properly recover, then it sort of feels like, okay, an opportunity every time you feel stressed instead of getting more stressed on the stress. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I love that. Um, so this is amazing. I We are wrapping it up, but I have, I have one... another question before oh, you go Jay's on yours. Done. Is that okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I just love these topics. One of the things, or actually a couple of the things that weren't touched upon your, in your documentary that I'm wondering if you feel they fit in are, well, I guess a couple things, and they're all kind of very trending topics right now. Um, the idea of using uh, chemicals such as like ayahuasca, psilocybin, or maybe even like weed. Um, using those types of chemicals to tap into these states, do you feel like they have a place in all this? For sure. I I do. Anything kind of born out of nature, I feel like should be explored. And, and I just know so many stories of people, whether it's weed and CBD or ayahuasca, like for different, again, different backgrounds of people, different types of diseases, like these, these plant medicines have really, helped, you know, and, um, so I'm all for, I'm all for plant medicine and, and, you know, and using uh, them as, th- as therapies. Like I've, I've personally tried ayahuasca twice. What was that and like? <laughs> it was so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so intense and aggressive. But Was yeah. this in your, like your twenties? Was this a party thing or explore, a, a explorative type thing for you? It wasn't a party thing. Okay. I would never, like I'm, I, I've never 
Yeah. Like, come on, Kelly, let's go trip balls in the <laughs> desert. Yeah, that's not my yeah. kind of partying either. <laughs> I had like, yeah, I feel like ayahuasca should never be a party thing. It's like <laughs> serious medicine. And if you want to go there, you better, you know. You better be Jim Morrison. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's definitely like a high speed, you know, train of, of healing. But um, so I tried it, you know, I, I was speaking to someone about it for a couple of years and I finally felt like ready to do it. And the first instance I did it was not in the right environment. It was not in like a safe, natural, spiritual environment. It was in like a downstairs condo in Century City in LA. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know. Um, but this was working with a shaman that came highly recommended by this, this woman that I trusted. And, but that experience, I didn't have the tools. I didn't have the preparation or the knowledge of like how to navigate the journey. Um, so it was super freaking intense and not enjoyable. It was like, it was just crazy. I was just like, this is like, I came home and I was like, don't ever let me do that again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, Cut I'm, to. <laughs> yeah. I'm so fascinated by like just hearing your story, like from talking to you and then watching your documentary, it seems like consciously or at least uh, outwardly, you kind of come off like, well, I don't really have any major things going on. I'm just really interested in it. But I'm like, there's there's got to be something, whether you've uncovered it or not, that is driving you towards this because it seems like you've been very, very committed and overly, strangely curious about all of these modalities and methods and procedures and more so than just like a curiosity. It seems like you're very, very driven and it's been that way for a really long time is do you not feel like there's got to be more than coincidence here? Like, yeah, I just, it is. It's 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 just this like insane curiosity and like really just trying to spiritually understand. I've gotten such glimpses of like deep understanding of how the universe works, and I just crave more understanding, you know. And I've had that since I was little, um, and. So this was part of it. It's just like, I want to understand like myself better. I want to understand if there's something subconscious that's, um, you know, blocking me or keeping me, who knows? I don't know. You're right. It's just this like insatiable curiosity. Like you feel a pull, but you have no freaking idea why. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I'm relating it right now because I've been uh, working on a book for about three plus years now. And like, if you asked me why I've been spending so long on it or why I'm doing it, I don't really know why. <laughs> I just feel like there's something in me making me do it. And yeah. I feel like there's a purpose and I may never even know the purpose of why I'm doing this. And I'm wondering yeah. if that's maybe something similar. You just feel like, I don't know. I just feel like a pull and I have to do it. And I, I love that you're you're so committed because I feel like a lot of people have something, some version of that that they deny within themselves. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's why I wish everybody starts the, their interviews of me with, you know, what, what caused you to do this documentary. And I'm like, it was, it's exactly what you just described with this book. It's, there's just a pull and a calling and this curiosity that I just don't, I can't explain with any specific one event that happened in my life. Yeah. And, and, you know, going to Michael Beckwith at Agape and, and taking classes from him. And he's just like, you know, when you have that call in your heart, you know, once you answer that call, like the universe just conspires to make it all happen. Like that's an, it's like a flag. It's like a light that goes off. It's like, if you have that pull, that is what you should be doing. Yeah. You can't life. unknow yeah. what you know and you can't unsee what you've seen. I think that's like when Chelsea and I became vegan, it was sort of like that. We, when you, when you're exposed to truths that resonate with you, you can't go backwards with that. Exactly. And that's that, that deep resonance, that knowing for you guys, it may, it may not be, you know, not everyone else is going to experience that same knowing in that same realm, but it's what you're supposed to, it's what you're supposed to be pursuing and sharing and doing, you know? So I'm an, I'm an artist. I'll let Chels get to her question. Sorry, I keep hogging the mic here, Chels. <laughs> I'm an artist and I feel like a lot of creative people have a version of this where you're like, I feel like I'm, I'm pulled towards creating a vision of a painting. I really don't know why. And I feel like if I have any answer for that, it's maybe just the journey itself. And maybe that's good enough. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, Jeffrey Thompson talks about, I go into it more in the book, 
but he's like, you know, there, there comes a time in your life where you feel this, you feel this calling. Um, but then you have these other people in, you know, there's a fork in the road. You have this calling, you have this passion, you have this desire, and then you have this other left turn where people are telling you, this is, you know, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, you should be whatever. And, and that's the one that has the safety net of the, the, the salary or the whatever. And so you take that left turn. And he said, that's when, you know, disease begins. That's when the breakdown begins. And it's like getting back to, and he talks about this story of like, this guy has cancer. Sometimes illness brings us to the place where we have to let go of the things that aren't working for us in life. And we go back to um, the, the right hand path. You know, and that's where we find our healing because we're aligning with that purpose in our life. We're aligning with our passion. We're aligning with that calling in our heart. And once we do that, it's like, okay, things are coming back into balance again. This is you're back on the right path kind of thing. So that that's really cool. So what you literally just explained, I mean, like the premise of this entire podcast is shifting perceptions based on people who have taken these bold leaps to shift towards the thing that really feels right. And like you literally just encapsulated that right there. Thank you. We have a new tagline. <laughs> That's great. Um, no, I appreciate it. And I think people need to hear it because if they are on the wrong path and they can feel it in their gut or it's starting to show up physically, which is hard for people to understand that it can, um, it's time to make major changes. So it's really- Yeah, it's almost like it's in, and we talk about this in the book, in the movie, it's almost like resistance is, is disease, you know, is stress and yes. disease. And and when you're resisting what that call is in your heart, what that purpose is that you're here for, when you're resisting and you go the safe route or you go the route the parents wanted you to go, that resistance builds up as stress and and it's going to break down your body. But if you if you kind of come back to that place and you and you follow you follow you're in the flow of what you're put here to do, that's when you know you can be healthy and thriving and and the universe conspires to to give you that kind of amazing, amazing experience. And there's so like no amazing. logic to it either. That's the thing. Like, like you said, with the career thing, following your, your urges and your desires and creativity, it, like, I'll, like, again, I'm an artist and the idea of doing that for a living makes no fucking sense, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's what has felt like my calling is. And I've, you know, pushed away all the logic to pursue something that I feel called to. And I think that's, definitely related to your documentary it's definitely related to your your purpose of what you're doing and i we appreciate that oh yay and go go artists i love it <laughs> we, i you know we that's that's exactly right and kudos to you for having the the courage to pursue pursue the you know the un, unsafe path yes um so we have one last question we ask all of our guests which i want to hear we didn't talk a lot about your childhood so um, the question is, if I had to drop you back in your childhood kitchen, so the kitchen that you grew up in, what's the first thought, sensation, whatever that comes to mind? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I first pictured like this yellow Cheerios bowl that I used to <laughs> eat cereal out of. And I just remember eating, you know, plain Cheerios because my parents wouldn't buy us the sugary cereals, but then we would put a tablespoon of white sugar on oh, yeah. the Cheerios. I used to do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first memory I had. But sensation wise, um, gosh, I don't know. I feel like nostalgic. Like I loved the house I grew up in. Um, awesome. That's a good answer. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Those Cheerios yeah. were so gross. I like my parents. We, <laughs> we used to put like. This They're really a, good with a pound of sugar on them, though. I if, know. Oh, God. Even worse, I used to put sweet and low on them, which oh, is hard. I know. God. It's terrible. Oh, God, I know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually shocked at, that my insides are functioning today. I grew up on McDonald's and Domino's Pizza. I mean, I like, I would definitely, I was a picky eater that ate just all the crap that was out there. Yeah. Amazing. I'm, I'm healthy today. Yeah. Well, um, this is amazing. So can you just tell our guests where people can find you? Sure. Um, well, you know, you can to watch the documentary. Um, we're on Netflix, iTunes, Amazon. You can go to healdocumentary.com and all the links are there to buy the DVD, et cetera, information on the experts, et cetera. Yeah, congrats on Netflix. That's huge. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a good, we, you know, we did the deal a year ago, but they were like, okay, you're coming out February of 2019. And it felt like an eternity to wait. But I think, again, divine timing, people are really, really hungry and ready for it right now. So 
good. You, it, it must have been so trippy. Like just that you said you started out with the secret and then now you have a film that's in the same genre and with the same <laughs> a lot of the same people. Like I'd be I'd be tripping balls if I was you. <laughs> that's pretty it's, insane. It's pretty wild. I'm like, oh, okay, manifestation. Like I we have the same book publisher, same BBD publisher as the secret. It's like it's pretty wild. Yeah, that's amazing. But so yeah, so we're at Heal Documentary on on Instagram and Twitter, and I'm at Kelly Gorris. All right, G O R E S. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So that was pretty cool. I really enjoyed that. I love how she kind of curated these experts into a documentary that gives like a uh, a, a combination platter of people to choose from to find a method that works for you. I know. Well, I actually think it's really relatable for me because I think you are quick to like dive headfirst into some of these topics and read the most complicated books on earth. And (laughs) I like these more teaser sort of overview things where we can get a little piece of each and figure out which one fits you best. Yeah, you totally pegged me because I'm definitely that guy. Like I, I get into one of these topics and I like become obsessive. I feel like it's it's really intriguing to me to be able to tap into the mind-body connection. And a lot of the experts she had on, I I knew about very well. And I loved how she kind of brought them together. Yeah, well, and also just sort of discussing the secret with such an open mind. I think some people get resistant to that. But when you combine it with science and then bring in the spirituality aspect, it makes it relatable. Instead of having it just be like, oh, this is another one of those hokey things. This documentary in general, like, you guys have to watch it. I know I said it like 12 times, but it really is very easily digestible and helps you guide yourself towards which things you're going to fit into a little bit easier than just maybe modern medicine, which is kind of what we're resisting against. I think a big takeaway or a big note to make here is that if you are someone that is not necessarily totally into or open-minded to these sorts of things, it may seem a little woo-woo and weird. but the whole thing for me is that there's no, I think it was made clear from our conversation as well as the documentary that there really is no one solution that fits everyone. These are just different pointers to bring you to po- something that possibly might help you out. And I loved that. I loved that was made clear from this because you can really eat kale salad and you can meditate and do yoga and you could do, you know, eight out of 10 things in your head right. And if it's one thing that's kind of holding you up, that's going to be the one thing that impacts your healing. Yeah, I know it is filling in the blanks on like which one might be missing at the moment for sure. Well, we really want to hear feedback on this one because I think that you guys are going to love her and realize like she's just such a I, honest. She's like very honest and upfront about her journey. And- so cool. Like she was really um, easy to get along with. Like I felt like we connected with her really well. She definitely seems like one of our peeps. Yeah. And she also just, I don't know, it makes it in the sense of like, she wasn't like Joe Dispenza doing this. She was like, uh, I'm so inspired because these things changed my life. And it makes it relatable for all of us. Like any of us could go down this path. It doesn't have to be that we're the smartest or the, the, like, the most ready to dive into 30 books about spirituality. You can really just get your toes wet. That's all. That's a really good point. Like You don't have to be an expert or completely educated in science or neuroscience or biology or any of these things to benefit from this or understand this. I think that was great to like connect with her and understand that this is just her one of her dreams and and one of her uh, visions that she came upon to see through, and that's what made the documentary what it is right now. It was just a, a manifestation for her. Yeah, for sure. Well, I hope you guys loved every second. And if you guys hear all of our kids in the background, we are actually traveling. We're in Providence currently. Yeah, we. I think so far we've heard sirens. Our children are locked in a bathroom. <laughs> Not actually locked. <laughs> They're in the bathroom watching an iPad for five minutes so that we can do this. Um, so our apologies for any uh Cute little toddler sounds in the background. Yeah, or fortune cookies being opened is what's going on right now. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, If you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast which is the same as our website, shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. We look and reply to all comments, so please share with your friends, tag us. We appreciate all the love. And don't forget that 
all of our guests also see all these comments. So I'm sure if you want to just have a space, you can reach out. These are the places to do it. Um, we also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudiollc.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.